this is an odd place for a nice Jewish boy like me to give a sermon on a Sunday morning. <laughs> I didn't know if you knew that or not. So I'm here to talk about culinary justice. And basically, that's the idea that communities, cultures, ethnicities, have a right to the inherent value and worth of their gastronomical production. I'm in Europe. That's, no, that's, that's not a strange thing here. If you want champagne, you go to a certain place in France. If you want a certain type of Italian cheese or meat product, there's a protection for it. But where I come from, the African diaspora, there are no protections on the culture and the culinary productions and other things that we have produced, we're constantly being appropriated, misused, and abused. These flashpoints, like John mentioned, are frequent. They're like the intellectual heartburn of being black. You know, every time you look around, there's a new thing. In America, we, have, we now have the Thug Kitchen. Two vegan chefs who, who are white and upper middle class from California pretending to be me, only I don't cuss that much. <laughs> oh, is that, uh, 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 that kind of thing. You know, MFing, you know, eat like you give, uh, et cetera. Aping a certain aspect of one tiny bit of African American culture, and they get a lovely deal out of it. But me, every time I put on the clothes of an enslaved man, and cook on a plantation in the American South. That's a revolutionary act. Who's there to greet you? I don't know if you know this or not, but we have this extraordinary industry in what we call plantation museums in the South. You go to the plantation, you expect white columns, there's this lovely little girl there waiting for you in a crinoline hoop skirt, and a 50-year-old man sausage into a Confederate uniform pretending to be a 20-year-old boy. Totally, totally historically accurate. And then there's me, and that creates a problem for a lot of people. Because what I'm doing is connecting the contemporary with the historic. It is not necessarily essentially American, but it's a deeply Southern problem. And we Southerners are very proud of our history and our culture. As John mentioned, how I approach this comes from my bloodlines. You know, everybody wanted to talk about what the origin of the word thug was, and how they connected to culture and history. Everyone wants to talk about flashpoints. There's Paula Dean, there's Ferguson, there's this new Thug Kitchen nonsense, and there'll be another one long after. But there was one that they missed. In Food and Wine magazine, a certain Southern chef, and I'm not going to be an ad hominem attacker today, so I'll let his name be. You'll, you'll go look it up later. But it said the words, this white Southern chef, that he discovered the African roots of Southern cuisine. And this is after Paula Dean. That only he, playing, and I'm quoting this magazine, pulling the white chef version of Henry Louis Gates, discovered a whole new aspect of the history of Southern food that no one thought to investigate before him. And that totally went under the wire, because that is part of the course. I'm very deeply aware that origins are the source of all of our ails and all of our solutions. When you are oppressed, and you can take that definition however you like it, how you survive your oppression is a form of capital. And how that capital gets spent is essential to your progress. But what happens when you're oppressed once and then the capital from your survival of the oppression gets appropriated? So you've not only been done over once, but twice. I'll put it to you like this. Because we're family, you and I. You understand? I'm not just talking to my African and Caribbean folks in the audience either. You all know what I mean. There are millions of us cousins, millions of black Americans who trace their roots back to France, Ireland, and England. You're welcome at the next family reunion, but I promise you it's potluck. I'm not cooking fried chicken for all of y'all. <laughs> that ain't happening. So just, just know that. But, I, but we, we welcome with open arms. 
My aunt will probably make that much catfish, but that's another story. When we look at you and you look at us, remember this. This is not just inherently American. This problem started here. This problem started on the coast of West Africa. This problem will endure as long as the generations come and go and come and go and come and go. But it is our job not to finish it, but to, to keep the work going and progressing towards a better future. The language that I speak, the songs that my ancestors created, they took the language of a king and made it world poetry in the mouth of a slave. Our ancestors clapped and stomped English hymns into the spirituals with fiery force. This precious stone set in silver sea, this blessed earth, this realm, this England is as much my homeland as it is yours. And to the extent that we are dealing with the consequences of the transatlantic world, we are all connected and therefore this issue is not just American or Southern, it is international. It is an issue about power. How do we in a global world where culture is shared, it is also appropriated, stolen, it's sometimes compensated through fair trade. How do we ensure that these legacies do not perpetrate themselves in a way to ensure further disadvantage in communities that cannot take it any further? Imagine a world, especially in my world, where African Americans who live a life that is disproportionate to where we should be in terms of progress, food deserts in black communities. There are limitations on what you can buy, your access to good food. And when you have food, heirloom crops, heritage breed animals that speak to your ancestors' legacy, like that Carolina gold rice you saw, those things are appropriated. In Charleston, South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina had roughly 40% of all enslaved captives brought to North America. I'm going to Liverpool this week to see where many of those ships were outfitted, built, and left. Charleston, South Carolina imported people like my sixth great-grandmother, who I know only through DNA and historical context. She was a member of the Mende people. Apparently, I have more than one Sierra Leone connection now that more tests are coming in. And that whole rice industry, which created millionaires in two seasons, Charleston was the most cultured place in North America, the site of its first museum, bookstore, massive library, all built on the backs of the slave trade. Charleston, South Carolina, where you have restaurants that laud this boutique product of Carolina Gold Rice, are living next to a food desert called East Charleston where the majority of black Americans live in that urban area. And I promise you, they cannot afford a $14 bag of Carolina gold rice, which their ancestors brought two centuries ago from the continent of Africa. When I go on these plantations and I embody the legacy of my ancestors, I'm going to do a revolutionary act of war because guess what? There are people who don't want to remember that history. There are people who don't want me to tell the story in a contemporary context or make the argument, and I'm not arguing for a culinary Zimbabwe, so don't misquote me. I'm not saying get out. I'm not saying leave us alone. I'm saying respect us, work with us. Have African-American boys and girls who live in impoverished communities grow food that connects them to their ancestors and to their legacy in their community they can sell. Teach them to be chefs. Teach them to be agronomists. Teach them to be scientists. Let them have ownership and responsibility and respect for what they came from. Because I promise you something. You've heard a big lie about us in America. It's not bullets that kill black boys. It's lack of identity. It's not bullets that kill black girls. It's lack of knowing who you are. And how could you know who you are when the whole culture has, has deemed us towards amnesia and forgetting? I was never supposed to know this, where I came from. That 100-something-year-old man, that picture you see in front of you, he was born enslaved in Virginia. 
He died when my father was 13. These hands have touched hands that touched an enslaved man. This is not forever ago. This is our present life. And instead of perpetuating this drama of you're this race and I'm that race, no, we're one human race and one human family. If you are white, you're not my combatant. You are my cousin. We can only save each other. We can only help each other. And by eating at the same table and coming to the same table of brotherhood, can we infect, can we affect a certain change that will eliminate a lot of these issues? Hunger, disrespect for the environment. It would be a lot better if people of color felt an ownership in those issues. It can't just be one person of one background over here saying, thou shalt. And another person over here saying, but I can't because I don't have access. I don't know how to, or I don't feel empowered to say. If we keep going like that, we will always have these other problems. Culinary justice is not an elite issue. I was once challenged on this by a food justice activist who also was African American. And she said, this is a very elitist thing you're bringing up. And I said, no, it's not. Because if all you have is rice and beans, and somebody steals your rice and beans, and turns it into the next culinary trend or fad that you have no access or control over, then food justice doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't take something elite or precious in someone's eyes for it to be trashed by someone else. There is a certain balance we have to strike between what culture we give freely and the culture we protect. Our food was the way that our ancestors preserved themselves. When I was in Brixton Market yesterday, I saw okra and watermelon and Congo peas, which you call the pigeon peas here. And I saw hot peppers and I felt at home because I knew that they took our names. They took our religion. They took our gods, but they didn't take our food. It's the last thing to go in any culture. The last thing to go in any place is what you put in your stomach that reminds you of who you came from and where you're going to go, the earth. So whenever I see this, I'm reminded that we are stronger than the things that have oppressed us. When I go to these plantation communities and plantation grounds, it's a sacred space, not because of the suffering there, but because of the success that I can come back in 2014 and cook there and meditate and teach and let people know the truth. I was on a plantation in Virginia one time, which shall remain nameless, because I want to be invited to speak and tell the truth one day. And the docent giving the tour said, you know, master so-and-so, he made sure that his slaves could feed themselves after the Civil War, so he taught them how to grow their own gardens and raise their own animals. And my friend at the time, a blessed memory, Kathy Thompson, white American, several black grandchildren, was also a living history professional herself, said, I'm sorry, that's completely wrong. And the docent was horrified as she told this in front of the local chapter of the Daughters of the Confederacy. By the way, they were the only other company there. And the Daughters of the Confederacy said, lift, one lifted her hand after the speech about how black people kept themselves alive and survived. She said, are the windows original? That's a hell of a statement, isn't it? <laughs> Forget that history, are the windows original? And then the women went and, and wept over the crib of Robert E. Lee and prayed over it. I'm not making this up. But at that moment, I had to run. I had to go, I was about to have a one-man slave revolt. <laughs> but Beyond all of that, it does, that's not important to me now. What's important is that you know this truth, that food connects us, that food liberates us. And by sharing our pasties and our collard greens, well, I won't say stargazy pie because I don't want to share that with anyone. <laughs> but by sharing our food traditions and talking about where we've come from and where we're going, we remind ourselves that we are one family with one destiny and one aim. Thank you.